Um, hello, Django Boston. Um, given this is the Django meetup, I assume everyone is at least excited to hear about the Django part of this talk. And uh, hopefully I can convince you to be excited about the security part, or at least afraid. Um, so I'm Zags. Um, that's short for Benjamin, as you can see. Uh, I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Zagran, um, which in addition to being an MLA Mountain Pass, uh, is a custom software development company. We're based in Delta Boston here. We do full stack, web, mobile, um, backend, server setup, the whole gambit. Our backend of choice is Django, which is you know, one of the reasons I'm giving the talk today. But the bigger reason is we just did, one of our customers is the state government. Um, we don't, they're actually, it's our only project with the government. We work with a lot of startups, other companies. Um, but we built them a project in Django. I know the government using Django is a little, is a bit surprising. Um, we managed to, they talked themselves into it and then brought us in to build them out when they got into trouble. So um, the reason this project is interesting to you guys is because we just went through the ringer. We had to go through a security audit using with our, with our project built in Django. And we passed, which is great. And we actually did so well on the first round that their head of security came to me and said, how did you do it? We've never seen a project do this well. And Part of the answer is, well, we use Django, and you did a lot of freebies, but the rest of the answer is stuff I'm going to talk about today. Um, and then also the security vendor pointed out a couple like really weird corner cases that we had to fix, and so that's kind of the rest of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so anyways, hopefully if you need to you know, have security that rigorous, uh, this will help you out, or just you know, email me or hire us or something like that. Um, so in order to talk about security, first we've got to actually talk about what that means. Because security in the abstract doesn't exist. Um, right? We have to have things we're trying to prevent or else we can't prevent them. Uh, so the, the things that I want to talk about preventing today are just three things. Data theft, malicious data alteration, and data vandalism or destruction. And you're like, really? That, that's it? But if you think about what data is in the digital age, money, health records, you know, personal information, election results. This is basically everything that we care about in the modern world, except for physical goods. There's a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, these are things that sometimes get misfiled under security. So denial of service attacks is not really a security issue. I mean, it's an issue for your company. It's an issue for your users. But a denial of service attack is just people making more requests than they're supposed to, and making requests is usually the whole point of your website, or responding to requests. Fake account creation. Facebook is doing a very heavy ad campaign about how they're combating this, but at the end of the day, making accounts is something you probably want your users to be doing. So, right, these guys aren't security issues per se, so I'm not going to talk about them. Physical security, out of scope, I've got like one sentence on it later, but otherwise, you know, we're not really going to talk about that. Right, so there's, there's a bunch of stuff I'm not going to deal with. So we're just going to focus on really your data and protecting that. Um, and you're like, well, why just, like, is data really all there is? The answer is yes, because your code is also data. So if people can modify your data, they can modify your code too, because your code is stored on files on computers. So basically, from a security perspective, this is what you care about. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, Security is also about not making mistakes. I mean, at a very basic level, security is about having protections, right? You have a, a house or an apartment, you want to keep people from stealing your stuff, you put locks on your doors and windows, and great, you have security. Software is the same way. There are basic protections you can get pretty easily, but, it's the, but you have to make sure those protections are always there. If you have locks on your house, and you walk out of your house one day and leave your house unlocked, you've made a mistake, and anybody can come to your house and take your stuff. Same thing with your website. So the best way to have security is automatic protection, right? If in your house your door locks automatically, every time it closes, you can't forget to lock it, right? My apartment building has this, the front door, closes automatically, and because I'm far more security conscious than my neighbors, given I'm the one giving this talk, I love this feature, because I don't have to rely on my neighbors locking the door every time they go out. 
Similarly with a software crash, if you want automatic protection, because I'm sure all of you guys are security conscious, but what about your coworkers that are working on the same code basis, right? <laughs> want automatic protection. But automatic protection isn't good enough, right? If it were, I wouldn't be giving this talk. Django gives you tons of automatic, tons of automatic protection. But if you stick a doorstop in that door that locks automatically, guess what? You don't have protection. And with an apartment, you know, a failure of security is no big deal. In the scheme of things, like somebody has to actually be physically present to rob you of your things, whereas with a website, somebody just has to have an internet connection. So, right, making mistakes is a lot more costly um, in on the web. So, let's get into the things you need to know to not make mistakes. Um, there's going to be three big things I want to talk about. The three big security issues. We got SQL injection. Cross-site scripting, also known as JavaScript injection, and cross-site request forgeries. Prepare to be confused. Here the X stands for cross, here the C stands for cross. I did not come up with these acronyms, otherwise they'd be standardized. Uh, and then there's going to be some more stuff that we get to at the end that are just kind of bonus round. We're going to go through a bunch of stuff real fast, and it'll be great. Um, so SQL injection, you got to start there. Um, this is according to OASP, which is, you can look up what the acronym stands for. Uh, it's an organization that does stuff around web security. This is the number one web application security issue of 2017. They publish the report every four years, so this is currently the number one issue. And it was the number one issue in 2013, and probably for many years before that. So what is SQL injection? Um, SQL, database technology, MySQL, PostgreSQL is probably what a lot of you are using. Um, so let's say you've got a form on your website. And we want to accept user input for reasons like we're building a website that does anything. Um, so we have got an input field. And you know, we take a name, somebody hits submit, and then on the back end, we've got a SQL query. SQL stands for structured query language. So you do database operations like finding or updating data using queries. So you make a SQL query. You want to stick the dynamic user input into your dynamic query so you can have dynamic behavior. And I'm going to try and not say over dynamic again. And then you run the query. And so far, everything here is fine, right? We've taken the user input, we've done something based on that, and that's lovely. What could possibly go wrong? Well, according to Randall Monroe, um, we've got this lovely XKCD comic. So what can go wrong is your users are not all nice users trying to use your system as you intended it. There are people out there trying to destroy, modify, et cetera, your data. Um, so let's say somebody fills in Randall Monroe's proposed pack. They fill in the name Robert, followed by a single quote, a semicolon, and then another SQL command, like drop table students. Um, so what happens here is if we naively stick this into our SQL query, um, what's happened is that this has actually turned into two SQL queries, because the closed quote of the semicolon um, has actually ended the first command sequence, and then we got another one in the user input. And this lovely red X means that we've just gotten hacked. How did this happen? Um, how this happened is a principle called in-band signaling. So SQL uses in-band signaling, which means there's one stream for both commands and data. Right? Going back to the SQL query, we've got select from where these are all commands. And then we've also got you know, the table name and the parameters name equals Robert. These are data. In-band signaling means there's just one channel for this data and for the commands. An example of something with out-of-band signaling is if you've got a RESTful API, you make a post request. Um, the URL is the command. The payload with the parameters, that's the data. There's two separate channels for those. And because they're separate channels, you don't have to worry about it. Nobody talks about post request injection attacks because there's a separate channel for the data. But SQL, in-band signaling, we have this problem. So, the bigger problem is, and so you're like, all right, great, well, let's just not allow apostrophes or single quotes in our data. Um, well, Mr. O'Brien uh, would like to have some words with you then, because you know names can have apostrophes in them. This is valid input. So we need a way to represent control characters in our data without these getting misinterpreted as, as, uh, as control characters. We need to have to be able to represent them as data. SQL lets us do this, right? So in MySQL and Postgres, if you put two single quotes in a row, this is called escaping the, the single quote. And so instead of interpreting that as one quote of control character, it interprets it as one quote of, of data. Um, and basically, you know, everything has got you know, Python. You can escape stuff backslash. You know, HTML has got its ampersand. Right? 
pretty much every language has ways of doing this kind of escape sequence to prevent this problem. Um, and so Django escapes your SQL input automatically. Great, why have I been wasting your time talking about all this SQL stuff? Um, well, because there's none left here, unless you use its raw SQL functionality. And in case you think no one would ever do that, they would. I've seen it on multiple code bases. So in Django, you can just do raw SQL commands. I don't know why you would to this day. Um, but you can. So this is the normal Django query to get all your students. And here's the Django query using raw SQL to get all your students. Now, this guy right here, using the just kind of native Django query syntax, is more concise, more readable, more portable, and more secure. And I have got nothing good to say about this guy. Um, but there's not a red X here. There's just that yellow warning sign. Because this is a statically defined query. Because we're not taking any user input, any dynamic user input into here, there's nothing that a user can do using a form to maliciously impact our database. So, so far we're safe except for you know, all the reasons I said you shouldn't do this. Um, it's only if we actually put user input into here that we run into problems. So, we're going to do that filter. This is the way to do it in Django. Nice, concise, readable. And here's how you get hacked. Um, you do that lovely raw SQL query and you put in a dynamic parameter and you fill in that user input and boom, little Bobby tables deletes your database. But there's three things on here, not two. Why did I put this guy in the middle? These two, while they look similar, are different in an extremely important way. This is the safe way to do raw SQL queries. So the difference between these two, here you've done string formatting yourself. You've passed the user parameter into your string, whereas here you've just passed those parameters in as extra arguments to Django's raw command. So here, Django will actually escape the parameters for you, whereas here it will not. Everything's ruined. The reason you shouldn't use raw SQL is because how many of you could tell the difference between these two as soon as I loaded the slide? All right, you can use raw SQL. Everybody else won't do it. <laughs> but more important, so first of all, these are very visually similar. That's, that's already bad, right out the gate. But also, like more importantly, even if you know what's going on, right? you've sat through this talk and know why this is bad, Another developer who comes on, who's working on the code base, doesn't know what they're doing, is just copying code patterns they see elsewhere, they might do this by mistake. So basically always do this. If you're like, but SQL's got this awesome command that I really want to use, odds are Django lets you do it, you just need to use a bunch of double underscores. That's the topic of a whole other talk, I might get some other one. Um, and just don't use raw SQL. That was easy enough. All right. Moving on to XSS attacks. Um, so SQL injection on one hand is the simplest, and on the other hand is the most important. As, as we get deeper, this stuff is going to get like harder for attackers to exploit, but also harder for you to fix. So brace yourselves. Um, I prefer to think of these as JavaScript injection attacks, uh, and that's because you know it's got that whole lovely injection bit that makes you think of SQL injection, because it's a similar, similar problem, not exactly the same. This is OASP number seven, what happened to two through six. We'll see a couple of them later. Uh, you can look, look up the list yourself, but a couple of two through six are don't write the wrong thing in your code. It's, it's a good list. All right, XSS attacks. This looks somewhat similar, but different in one way. All right, so the user fills in malicious input into our form, and then that gets saved to the database. Ooh, there's the difference. And then later an admin, let's say, is looking at a list of all of you know, the students, and they get student Robert script post set password close script. Um, and that gets displayed, and then that JavaScript runs, and it runs on the administrator's browser, and it does something bad on their behalf, like sets their password to something that the attacker knows. That's bad. We just got hacked. So this should look similar to the SQL injection attack, but is slightly less bad. That's not to say, that's why it's number seven, not number one, right? The SQL injection, as soon as it hit the database, boom, we were ruined. Here, this gets stored in the database and then happens at a later time when an administrator loads the page. The other difference here is that this isn't able to execute just arbitrary commands. I mean, you can do bad stuff like, I don't know, record the keystrokes that an administrator is doing or create administrator accounts. So like, this gives a user basically any permissions that your system has, but it doesn't let them do like absolutely anything. 
it's still bad, okay? It's just not quite as bad. <laughs> All right, so how do we protect against this? I hope at least half of you guessed we're going to escape our input, um, because that's what you do against injection attacks. And Django templates do this automatically, and we're not, no, wait, just kidding. Unless, um, and the unless, it's always you can stick that door stop in and then keep your automatically locking door open. You use the safe or auto escape off features. So Django doing this automatically was a huge coup in Django 1.0. I know, it was throwback Thursday. Um, previously, Django did not escape automatically. You had to put auto escape on on all your templates. This was a backwards incompatible change, so they had to wait for Django 1.0 to do this, and then they did it, and this is great for everyone in this room. Thank you, Django. But you can turn it off. Convenient. Why would you do that? Um, so you do that probably because you're generating some HTML yourself on the back end. And if you're doing this, you have to do the escaping of any user input you're including in that yourself. Otherwise, there's JavaScript injection possibilities. Um, so Django's got some lovely utility functions to do this escaping for you on the back end, right? The, uh, the escape or the escape JS functions. But if you're including user input in that HTML that you're preparing on the back end, you have to be really careful. Um, and like, that's like, that's another statement. Um, so, all right, let's run through the examples. So here we have, right, actually doing this normally in a Django template, totally fine. You're totally, you're totally safe. And ironically, including the word safe makes you not safe. Boom, you get hacked. Um, so right, super straightforward. Except. You're like, JSON's fine, right? Nobody talks about JSON security holes. People talk about XML security holes, but not JSON. JSON is not as safe as you think. And the reason for this is that HTML has a really screwed up priority for how it interprets tags. So HTML, the thing it cares about most is like matching that open tag to that closed tag. Now there's some tags that we might include on our page, like I don't know, script. Where we're like, we've got this other syntax going on in there. We've got, you know, quotes and strings and valid JavaScript. And HTML does not care about that. If it sees a closed script tag, boom, it's done. So while JSON is going to do escaping of characters like quotes that JSON cares about, JSON is not going to do escaping of HTML tags. And that leaves us in this lovely situation where let's say we've got this person whose name is, for some reason, uh, closed script, open script, post set password, closed script. Right, great, great name. Uh, some of my best friends are not named that. <laughs> and then we convert that to JSON on the back end, thinking we're totally fine, and we pipe that through the safe filter. If you don't put that through the safe filter, this is not going to get rendered to anything sensible that you can use with your JavaScript. It'll just it'll be garbage. Right? So you put it in the safe filter so that you can use that value in your JavaScript. And what happens is, so we're running along, we've got some JavaScript, boop, yep, okay, name. And we've got the quote, and you're like, but hang on a second, right? This is all just in a string. That's totally fine. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is the browser's like, I don't care what your JavaScript is doing. That's the end of the script block. You've got some invalid JavaScript in here, whatever, that's your problem. And so then this just gets run as its own script. So if you're using JSON and putting it through the safe filter, you have to escape or get rid of the angle brackets yourself. That's the, uh, that's the gotcha here. But what if I want my users to find custom HTML, you ask? Please, don't ask this. I mean, or ask this. You don't want your users to do that. Um, and let me, let, apparently it is Throwback Thursday because we're talking about MySpace now. <laughs> All right, so MySpace let users define their own HTML homepages. It was great. This was like revolutionary. Um, revolutionarily bad, it turns out, from a security perspective. Because this guy, Sammy, spelled like you wouldn't expect, uh, included this lovely bit of JavaScript on his custom HTML homepage. And what it did was whenever you viewed his page, it added something to your page that said, Sammy is my hero, as well as the JavaScript to populate this lovely virus. Uh, well, worm, I guess. So the Sammy worm infected a million profiles in 20 hours. Sammy actually got slapped with a felony, which included a year of not being allowed near a computer with internet. Um, imagine that in the modern age. Um, you just like have to move to an uninhabited item. Um, but but worse yet, like okay, sure, he got charged with a felony, but also a million profiles on MySpace got vandalized. Right? You as a site administrator don't care what happens to the hackers if your site or your data gets messed up. Um, so 
you just don't want to deal with the headache of letting users define HTML. It's not a good idea. Um, Markdown is a much better option for a whole multitude of reasons, including it's simpler for users to use, non-technical users have any idea what to do with it, and it doesn't have any of these security issues. Um, GitHub, Stack Overflow, Trello, um, all of them use some variant of Markdown. Um, there's other options too, that's just kind of my, my first answer to that question. Um, and that's, that's cross-site scripting, um, where the X stands for cross. So now the C stands for cross in cross-site request forgery. All right, this one, this is the OS number eight in 2013. I didn't say 2017 because it didn't make the top 10 list in 2017. And the reason for that is because of things like Django that include automatic protection against this. So Django's protected automatically. Why am I talking about it? Oh, you'll find out. Um, all right, it's time for, uh, time for Sesame Street to make an entrance. We're gonna talk about cookies. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard way more than you wanted to about cookies because every single website now includes a disclaimer, this website uses cookies. Uh, this is because the European Union tried to regulate the internet and for reasons that I find unfathomable, anyone cared. Um, also, every website uses cookies. Cookies are how you log into websites. Like, okay, so yes, the web uses cookies. Welcome to 2000 anything. <laughs> All right, so what's a cookie? Um, HTTP, the protocol that the web runs on, is allegedly stateless. Every request that you make from your browser to a server is sent without any knowledge of anything in human history except the invention of the internet. And so you send that request, and you know there's just no information associated with that in pure HTTP. Well, that sounds bad because you know if you want to have something like a login on your website. You probably don't want your users to have to input their username and password anytime they click anything on your website. So the workaround for this was cookies. Cookies are a service that browsers offer. Um, basically, every browser has them. And your browser has a setting to turn them off, which if you use that, the internet stops working for you. Um, where the browser will store pieces of data on the app websites. Right? So the website says, hey, browser, please store, oh, I don't know, a session ID for me, and then send that back to me with every request. And they do that. And, you know, it seems like keeping security here would be important, and it is. So cookies only get sent to on, along with requests that match whatever website they're configured for. And the only websites that can read a cookie using JavaScript are ones that match the domain as well. So that, that sounds fine, right? What's wrong with that security-wise? What I didn't say is that the that cookies are only sent with requests from that website. I said they're only sent along with requests to that website, which means you're logged into Bank of America over here. You're logged into Cool Cat Picks over there. That domain is available last time I checked, so <laughs> anyone wants to buy that, go for it. Um, and you want to click this button here that says give me more Cool Cat Picks. Um, this button is actually a submit button on a form that's going to make a post request to Bank of America that's going to transfer $1,000 to their Cayman Islands account. And because that is your request to Bank of America from your browser, this cookie helpfully gets included with that and you just got hacked. Personal security note, this is different from Django, I'm going to do a bit of a detour. If you want, like Bank of America does implement cross-site request forgery protection, but Best practice when doing online banking is to not have other tabs open. Anyways, all right. Back to what to do with your website. Um, so we obviously need to protect against this. We as website designers need some way to verify that requests to our site are coming from pages on our site, because this is really bad. That's just, like, it's also really roundabout. Like, like we, we as the web community have managed to patch at least most of the time, the obvious stuff like SQL injection and JavaScript injection. So this is what hackers are resorting to here, all right? So good job, guys. Now let's fix this. All right, so how do we fix this? Um, Django's automatic protection. Hey, great, you add the CSRF middleware, view middleware, okay? If you create a Django project using the Django command for it, this is in there automatically. And then every one of your forms that do a post, put, patch, or delete, you gotta include this CSRF token. And that's it, that's not it. 
All right, so in order to understand why that's not it, we gotta dig into what the CSRF middleware does. And obviously, the answer to we have a problem with cookies is more cookies, right? That really what that says? All right, so we're, I, we're, we're gonna go through this. We're gonna see how this works. You are, you're welcome to be skeptical. So we add an extra cookie. An extra cookie with a CSRF token. This is gonna be some random token. And then we've got this CSRF token tag that we add to each of our forms, and that adds a hidden input to that form, which contains that same token. So we've got this token in two places. It's in the cookie, and it's as an input in our forms. And so when you submit the form, it gets both of them, right? The cookies get sent with every request, so the cookie gets sent along with the form submission, and the input's part of the form, so that gets sent. And on the server, we can check. We can check do these match. And if they don't match, we reject the request. And if we're missing one, we reject the request. And the reason that this works is because cookies, right, well, cookies are sent with any request, only the originating server actually knows what's in them. Right here, when Cool Catfix is sending this post request, this is a blind right. It's got no idea what's in the cookie. It's got no idea you're even logged into Bank of America. It's just trying to do this in case you happen to be. And the only way they can see if this works is by logging into the bank account in the Cayman Islands and saying, hey, I got some money. So, your website, on the other hand, knows what it said in the cookie, presumably because you know it wrote it down somewhere, or it receives cookies on every request, or something like that. All right, so you've got your website has lots of ways of knowing what it put in this extra cookie, and so it can actually add this extra input field to your forms and verify its own requests to itself, which sounds a little circuitous, but you know is what we need to do here. And so everything's fine and dandy except, all right, here's the first except, and this doesn't apply to get requests. So a get request is how people get to your website in the first place. They've got to load a page on your site in the first place to even have a cookie where you can set this token or to have a form of that hidden input. So if users can't make, like users, we can't be doing this validation on get requests because then the first time somebody goes to your website, they get a CSRF validation error, it's a lovely 403 error code, and they go, well, this website's down, and they go somewhere else for their amusement, right? So we have to let people load pages. Now, the reason from just kind of a RESTful standard, REST is, you know, get, post, patch, delete, all those methods, right, that we can do this and like this is compliant with what these methods are supposed to be is that get requests are supposed to be stateless. You're not supposed to be doing data modification on a get request, so it's not like users making get requests are can do anything malicious, so it's fine to not protect them with the CSRF middleware. Which means if you let users modify data through a get request, you have circumvented all of this protection. So Let's say you've got an admin page and you want you know, your admin to be able to, I don't know, delete a student. And you're like, I'm just going to put a link next to each student in that table. And we can just pass the student ID as a URL parameter. Well, that's, that's not going to work because then you're making data modifications on the GET request. And the CSRF middleware doesn't cover GET requests. So you're not protected. Another website could be making CSRF attacks against this endpoint. You've got to say require post, or if you want to be a real stickler about REST methods, require delete. Okay, I know. Um, right, you've got to make sure that this is one of the REST methods that is safe for data modification, which is put post, put patch, and delete. Not get. The other thing here, and this is actually even worse, back in our example with Google CapEx, there was a form that we were submitting. Right, that, that was like you went on the other website, you, you clicked you know, a button that submitted a form. If you allow data modifications on a GET request, it's actually even easier for somebody to hack your website. All they have to do is put an image on their website, one pixel image, invisible image, something like that, and that'll get loaded just with the page and will make this request without your users even clicking on anything. So doing data modifications by GET requests is doubly dangerous, first because it's not protected by the CSRF middleware, and second because it is easier for a malicious website to exploit. Could you explain that again? The thing with the image. So, image yeah, tags. So, yeah, so, so back here, right, this is, this is, in order to exploit an endpoint that requires post, put, patch, or delete, you've got to have a form, and the user's actually got to click on button. 
Um, and then this will go and make a post request. And, and the user will actually see something weird happen. They'll get redirected to Bank of America and be like, how did I end up on the transfer confirmation page? Um, whereas if it's a get request, right, you can just include an image with the source being the URL you want to hit with those parameters you want in there. And that just gets loaded passively as part of the page. There's nothing the user needs to click on, and it'll still make that request to the other server. HTML image tag, not that that's what he means. So you channel image source equals URL endpoint. Yeah. It gets called on page load. Um, and this, by the way, just a totally random aside, is one of the reasons that Gmail um, doesn't load images in your spam email. Um, it's because those could contain CSRF attacks in them. Also, tracking pixels are the one legitimate use of modifying data by get requests. Um, because what you're doing is adding an image that modifies data. You're actually doing a CSRF attack against your own server to like track user behavior. Uh, weird way to think about it. All right. So now here's the doorstop that you can use to uh, let somebody rob your house. It's the CSRF exempt decorator. Um, this one's pretty obvious uh, that this is turning off a thing that I hope I've convinced you you need. Uh, so right, this is safe. This is not safe. Um, and by the way, this is safe because we're, we're using post parameters. I mean, right? you can't you can't fill that in from a get request. So so we're good on that front too. Um, so you're staring at this and you're like, why does that decorator even exist? Good question. The reason it doesn't exist is because you want to make post requests with JavaScript. Um, I said doesn't. This is not why you want to use this. So if you want to make post requests with JavaScript, yes, good, great. Right, web 2.0, all that stuff. We're not going to be using clunky HTML forms. We're going to use this fancy, you know, single-page Angular app, and we're going to be making, you know, JavaScript requests to the back end for all of our data applications. Cool. You still want to use that CSRF middleware. The CSRF middleware conveniently gives you two ways to verify that these requests are coming from your pages. One is to include the hidden input on fields, on a uh, hidden input on your form. The other is to include it as a header on the request you're making to the server. And every single JavaScript framework worth its salt has a way for you to configure this for all of your HTTP requests. So okay, here's examples for jQuery, Angular 1, and Angular 2 Plus. Um, you have to tweak these a bit to make them work for your code. You can find examples for you know, React and whatever other things you're using. Um, okay, so if you're making requests for jQuery or JavaScript or Angular, whatever, you still are using the CSRF middleware. You are not using CSRF exempt. Everybody with me on that, all right? No? All right, good. And so the legitimate reason this decorator exists is for people with external APIs, right? With an external API, it's another server, they're making requests to your server. There's no browser, there's no cookies, it's just two servers pinging each other in the void, okay? And so this is really getting back to the basics of, of what HTTP is about. We're not relying on sessions for anything. Our requests are stateless. And as a result of that, we're checking API credentials on every request. And while that's really arduous for users, you don't want your users to have to fill in their 16 character password every time that they make a request, that's totally fine for a server. Servers don't care. So if your requests are stateless, you're not using Django sessions for anything, if you are checking API credentials on every request, then and only then do you have my permission to use the CSRF exempt decorator. Mm -hmm. Except, all right. And so CSRF is fun because there's just there's so many layers to this. Subdomains, um, and this is not this is this is as much a quirk of this this is really a quirk of cookies. I'm not going to get into the reasons why, but basically subdomains can really screw with cookies. So if you're hosting your website on a shared subdomain, like oh, something.brokuapp.com or something.lsbs.com, you are not protected from other websites hosted on that same, so it's same domain name <coughs> from the perspective of CSRF attacks. So another website hosted also at whatever.brokuapp.com can circumvent your CSRF protection. This is a really easy fix. Get your own domain name. There's like 10 bucks here. Um, if you can't do that because, for example, your website is hosted at a subdomain of state.ma.us or something like that, um, 
You need to do something really convoluted. You've got to make a custom middleware, cryptographically sign your CSRF cookie and check the signature. To summarize that, you email me. <laughs> or Eli, who's the it. one that wrote it. Yeah. Uh, this is a pain, this is a real pain. So get your own domain name, it's great. Um, I gotta make a shout out just real fast. <laughs> Django has built into it a cookie signing feature. It's cool, use it. For some reason, the CSRF middleware doesn't. That's why this whole exists. But sign your own cookies. It costs you almost nothing, and your cookies can't be hacked. Well, and Django will sign your session cookies for yeah. you, which is the ones you usually care about. Um, it's just not the CSRF cookies for reasons that are a mystery. Um, all right. So those are the big three I want to talk about. Um, we're now just going to get into some like, like these are just, these are easy fixes. We're, we're going to go through these real quick, and then I'll take questions. Um, this is relevant to the yes. Things. I seem to remember that I had to use um, the, the uh, decorator when I was doing a custom upload. And I forget exactly why, um, but it was, if, if I didn't do that, it would, it would process something too early and it was just a mess. <laughs> but I don't remember exactly the details. Were you uploading directly to S3? No. No, this is a, uh, uploading to my server from. So in general, like if what you like with a custom upload, like the answer probably is to set a job the CSRF token in the JavaScript request headers. Um, and it, it might just be a quirk of whatever JavaScript framework you're using to do that. But like aside from external API, like you should always be using the CSRF framework protection. Um, I think I had a check to for it later, but it was it was where the processing it actually checked it. It, it, it did something before it should. But before it checked the presence of the CSRF token, so something could have happened in that period. It, it, it. All right. <laughs> so Jenkins said, "We're gonna. We're the, these, these are these are like. We're, there's a whole bunch of goodies in here. All right. Secret keys. So cryptographic signing, right? That whole thing that protects your cookies from being modified by other users." Uh, the secret key is used to sign your cookies. Uh, it's also used for the built-in password reset flow. That's secret in the name. If somebody steals it, they can break into any of your users' accounts. They can give themselves arbitrary privileges in your system, so keep that a secret. Great, that was easy. All right. Uh, databases. Um, uh, a lot of database engines, like Postgres, by default, do not use SSL to connect to your database. So if your database is off-server, like most like many common server setups, you gotta throw this option in there to you know have an SSL connection to your database. Odds are it's just running around inside like the Amazon data center, but you know, better better safe than than uh, I than Amazon steals your data. They have that anyways. Um, all right, here's some other settings that are great. I'm assuming you're using HTTPS. If you're not using HTTPS, all of your data has already been stolen, and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> There's so many ways to get free certificates now with CertBot and Amazon Certificate Manager. You have no excuse on this one. Um, but so things, assuming you're using HTTPS, we can throw in these settings, and then your cookies only get sent over to HTTPS, so that keeps them from getting stolen. That's nice. Um, we've got these guys that are provided by the Django Security Middleware. Um, you can email me. I'll send you. The, I'll also get the slides. It's also the, the the slides will be up afterwards. So don't don't write everything down. Copy and paste. Um, these guys make your, your SSL a little stronger. This guy, oh, am I not moving that? Oh, <laughs> going up on me. All right. So this guy prevents your website from getting stuck in an iframe, um, which makes phishing attacks harder. Um, right? These are just good things to have. Um, just make sure you have HTTPS set up before you enable this guy, or else uh, you can't actually get to your website. So okay, that's fine. Um, a lot of websites, if you don't do anything, if your, your website is used on a shared computer, by default, after a user clicks log out, somebody else can sit down on that computer, hit the back button on the browser, and see whatever page was there before, unless you throw the no cache headers on all your pages. Here's a lovely middleware courtesy of Stack Overflow that will add the no cache header to all your pages and prevent this information leak. All right, cool, there's pretty. Um, and oh, bonus round. All right, we got like, all right, here is the page. Remember I said OS by two through six might show up? Here they are. All right, so here's a different variation of OS number one. 
not just SQL injection. If you use eval or subprocess the shell true in, uh, in your Python code, hey, that opens you to injection attacks. Don't do it. All right, well, that's number two. Ooh, number two. Um, you should have a test that goes through all of your URLs dynamically and make sure they have authentication decorators. Right? You should explicitly list exceptions rather than you know, having that be opt-in because automatic security, better way of doing it. Um, oh, last number three, HTTPS, always have it, please. Um, also, you should always redirect HTTP to HTTPS. Um, that is hard to say. And if you use encrypted storage at rest for your databases and for your files, um, these are settings that Amazon just has check encrypt at rest. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, this protects you from, ooh, there's a callback, physical security. If somebody breaks into the Amazon data center, steals the disk out of a rack and runs off with it, your stuff's encrypted at rest and have not stolen your data. Um, oh, last number nine, automatically install minor version updates to system packages. If you don't do this, your company name is Equifax, and you have lost <laughs> all social security numbers in the US to someone in China. Um, Right, Equifax, they didn't install an update to, I think it was Apache for like four months, and yeah, and their data got stolen. Um, if you're using a lot of, the, like last Beanstalk, Roku, there's ways to automatically install system packages. If you're running your own servers, set a cron job. Um, minor version updates, right, they're, they're the ones that are supposed to be just, you know, the bug fixes, re-security fixes that don't make breaking changes, so you should be able to do this and not worry about it. And if you don't do this, do worry about it. Um, using Django's password storage automatically salts and hashes your passwords. If you don't salt and hash your passwords, your company name is LinkedIn, and you lose your password database. And it's really embarrassing because they didn't salt them. They hashed them. They didn't salt them. Um, and so everybody with one of the you know top thousand most common passwords um, was in trouble. Um, Captcha. Some people love it, some people hate it. If your website, if you care about brute force attacks on you know, logins, throw a CAPTCHA in there. If you want to not inconvenience your users, maybe give them a couple free tries before you throw a CAPTCHA in there. You know, just make brute force attacks harder. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I got for you. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. Um, that's my email. If you have you know, longer questions, if you need custom software work, um, if you need security work, I guess. Um, let me know. So we're going we're to toss the cube around for people who have questions so that we can hear them on the recording. So I guess go ahead and questions and we'll toss the cube. Any questions? No questions. Oh, I love that girl. Come on, guys. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, <that's> cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking about the audit you have. Yes. What were the things you should have to fix? What were the things that said saying? You said you had to fix some. Yeah. Um, so the things that we had to fix, so the, the JSON slide where JSON um, uh, doesn't escape the, 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 the close and open JavaScript tags um, was one of the fun ones that we ran into. Because we're like we're using JSON to serialize it, um, and it turns out the browser resolution of, of those tags is not what we thought it was. Um, the um, also the um, the uh, CSRF protection across subdomains um, was another one, and we had to build that that lovely piece of middleware to fix that. Two slides, courtesy of our security notes. <laughs> uh, did you use any uh, automated vulnerability testing uh, software? Or, I mean, would you recommend any to identify possible uh, vulnerability? So we didn't, but the vendor did. Um, they have a whole complicated set of automatic vulnerability scanners that they use. Um, I mean. In terms of like, if you want to go do checks yourself, I mean, the OF top 10 list is a great place to start. Um, it's 10 things, you go, you read them, half of them you're like, I don't, that's like, okay, great. You know, make sure that you check user roles on accessing your objects. Like, okay, yeah, that's what the testing is for. Um, so like, 
and, and then the other stuff is like Django has built-ins for this. It's really just about making sure you didn't miss anything. Um, so I, I, I guess the bad news is I don't have any recommendations for automatic testing frameworks. Um, but this is most of what you need to know. Um, there's a site called Sasha's Holy Checkup. So, Sasha? Sasha's Holy Checkup. <laughs> Sasha's pony, pony checker. Sasha's pony checker. Checkup. Checkup. Sasha's pony checkup is the recommendation. <laughs> I have not used this. This is I cannot that for it. Other questions? Thanks. Uh, are you sure about sites not being able to make cross-site post requests without user interaction? Um, so sites, so it, it's a complicated question. Um, sites can make cross-site post requests using JavaScript. There is a whole additional layer of protection against JavaScript, like cross-site JavaScript post requests that browsers have that you can then disable using um, you know, if you set a particular header for your site. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the CSRF middleware, like, will, like, that, that is what you should be relying on to protect your users against, like, post malicious post requests from other sites. Um, I guess it's possible that the other site could, like, load, have a form, and then click the submit button automatically with JavaScript. Um, I'm not sure. It's, I've, I've looked more into how to protect against this than how to how to actually do one. <laughs> I, I can't comment. Um, oh, crap. I'm so sorry. Um, the sort the automatic request to sources and tags on browsers was a security issue that came up about a year and a half ago, I think. Um, and I think the very naive check is. They're like, okay, we'll only do it for image formats or something, but it's browser dependent. It's not it's supposed to be doing a remote request to load an asset, and a browser can't know beforehand whether a particular domain is valid for such a use. Um, so they added a weak heuristic. So it's you should assume it's possible. Is, I mean, is my response. E even even if it like even if you can make it like a, a post request without the user clicking on it, get requests are still vastly easier because you can like email somebody a picture, um, and that'll set it off unless it gets caught by like Gmail spam filter and Gmail doesn't load images for things in spam. Um, so like it is definitely easier to do a malicious cross site get request. Um, so like that's definitely what you want to be. And, and, and more importantly, those aren't protected by the CSRF middleware. Sure. Oh, you. <laughs> um, are any of these uh, vulnerabilities um, more of an issue if you have like a, like a front end uh, framework like Angular or React and you're using Django just as like a, a back end? So, just kind of general advice for doing a lot of stuff on front end. You can't trust front end validation for anything, um, right? Like you, users have the ability to modify whatever your front end code is doing. They have the ability to send requests to whatever endpoints you expose to your front end. So all of the same best practices are are, are going to like doing. You have to do all the same stuff with your Django back end, whether you're doing you know, a simple web front end or like a single page JavaScript app. Um, basically, the only thing that looks different is just how you use the CSRF middleware. Um, and it's, if you've got a single page JavaScript app, you're gonna, you, you're most likely gonna be using that through um, the header as opposed to through form inputs. Um, but like otherwise, everything should look the same for you. Um, and like, like Django's protections, like the, <coughs> Those are automatic protections on data entering your Django app and like going through it. So it's right. The same protections are there, and again, the same pitfalls are there. You have to not, you know, circumvent those because you want to just get that that thing working. Anyone else? 
All right, well, feel free to talk to me afterwards. And so I got one. Okay. Uh, is there, what had, what does Django give us out of the box? Or is there anything that Django gives us out of the box uh, for security that you haven't mentioned? That I haven't mentioned. Um, or, or rather, kind of any big, sig I'm, I'm kind of thinking about like the big significant things that are like, easy to get wrong. So, other things that Django gives you. Um, these are kind of the big things Django focuses on. I mean, other things Django gives you that are definitely useful is like its authentication framework. It's very easy to use. The thing, you put it as just a decorator on your views, as opposed to you need to integrate complex authentication code into your, you know, into each page. Um, that's definitely a big upside in making authentication easier, making mistakes, you know, less common. Um, Python, and also pretty much every modern language, protects against buffer overflows, so like that's nice, that's not Django per se. Um, what else we got? I mean, there, there are, um, another one of the big ones that I didn't talk about today is XML parsing. I, I think I mentioned it offhand when talking about JSON. Um, I assume that Python has some, and Django may even have some extensions for like safe XML parsers. Um, who uses XML anyways these days? But um, you do? Well, or, no, I, I just, or you have a recommendation on XML well, parsers? Uh, John. Yeah. Yes. John? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned the, the talk by Colin. Um, yeah, they talked about it. Yeah, yeah. they specifically mentioned like the that XML um, <laughs> issue uh, in the OAuth. Uh, so you know, just another solid recommendation for. All right, so it's a timely podcast. Go watch, go, go, go listen to that if you want to learn about how to protect your XML, or just use JSON. Go watch which what, what do I want? Don't use YAML for the same. Thing. Don't use YAML. Well, or <laughs> be careful with YAML. What what, did, what was the topic again? Uh, it's the latest episode of Talk Python. So Talk Python, the latest episode. Talk Python to me. Talk Python to me. That's right. Um, <laughs> learn about about how to safely parse non JSON. Uh, I gave you the warning about JSON in here. Um, so like yes, I mean there's there's lots of stuff. These are I mean these are uh, um, I mean another one of the big ones is making sure that that user like objects that should only be access, accessible by certain user roles are only accessible by those roles. And again, Django's authentication framework provides decent support for roles. Like role is one of the, the built-in models in Django, um, and you can integrate that pretty easily into the authentication decorators. Um, so like yeah, there, there's definitely other stuff I didn't I didn't talk about. Um, but a lot of that falls more under the purview of like Django gives you support to write code, to kind of write code well that is secure, as opposed to kind of these guys, which are like the automatic security features for like the common vulnerabilities. I might, I might have one. Yeah. Um, uh, this came up in the security audit, and the difficulty is placing where within the blobs of code it was it was caught. But um, one of the things that you can do is you can submit a, a, a null terminated string when you're doing arbitrary requests to a server, and that was appropriately handled. Um, I believe it eventually is appropriately handled by your database, usually, rather than uh, the Python or Django library. But that class of thing, which is null terminated strings are insecure, and you don't use them because you don't write in C because you write in Python. <laughs> Ta-da! So um, that's the only one I can think yeah, of. Yeah. So so null terminated strings uh, somewhere in Django Python there's protection against those. I mean also just a lot of like just kind of that type checking that Python gives you um, as well as then Django gives you in the interface of the database. Um, so like there are a lot of protections for minor stuff. Um, valid date checking stuff like that. Uh, just not anything, not anything as interesting as these because the hacks are they're not like boom, here it is. <laughs> yeah. I'll project. Um, so just piggybacking on Bob's question a little bit ago about front end interactions with some of these things. If you are doing, if you're using a single page app and your intention is for the back end to operate like an API mm -hmm. and you know your front end is posted directly there, then at least Kind of page that you're going to be worrying about whether your back end is assuming that you know, CSR RF protection should be 
turned off and those types of things like you would normally do with a system to system API, but you're interacting with the browser here. What's your sort of sensibility about how to navigate treating browsers like API clients and navigating that? So with the with the single page JavaScript app, um, and then and the question is right with a right with a single page JavaScript app, what you have on the back end is basically an API. How is that different from an external API used by another server? Um, the problem with that is um, just kind of the, the question of how does with an API, you usually got to authenticate themselves somehow. Um, they either have to authenticate themselves with API keys, or they have to authenticate with the CSRF token and the session ID to verify that they are you know coming from your website, have valid session, something like that. Um, I mean, the question is just kind of which way you go about that. The session ID and CSRF token is kind of the more common way for um, for things for for consumer facing front ends because it's you don't API keys tend to be more permanent. You go, you hand them to somebody, you expect that they're going to treat them with you know the security of a password. Whereas anything you send to the user, they can they can look at, they can muck around with. You know, Snapchat had this issue back in 22 year, 2014, I think, where they were encrypting images sort of temporarily on the, the device, but it was with a, just a, a static encryption key. Um, right, like the same deal, if you're just sending an API key to your, your, your JavaScript clients and it's the same key for everywhere, that's not secure. A, a hacker could just take that and embed that same key in their malicious website. And if you are generating a new key for each user, effectively what you've just created is the session and CSRF framework. So like at that point, you might as well use them. Um, it gets a little more complicated for handling mobile apps because um, you like you you can't. I mean, there are still ways to do it. Although mobile apps, um, I mean. It's not always trivial to grab the token right. out of the mobile app. So, so there's, there's some more protections there. Um, and you can do something to establish a session at the beginning of the connection. If, you know, um, But at least for like single page JavaScript apps, because you can like inject parameters when you load that page for the first time, it's, it's um, um, and, and also the other thing about JavaScript is um, you can read those cookie values using JavaScript. Um, so you don't even have to inject any parameters. You can just have the JavaScript look at the CSRF cookie, load that value into the header, and send it. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And so this is generally like except both authentication methods against those endpoints. Is, yeah, both session authentication and token-based authentication. If you're planning on having it, um, you you can. I mean, if, if you, uh, I, it it depends on the use case. Um, it like. You know, ideally, you would have just kind of one authentication type per endpoint, and if you want to do similar things for different authentication types, I don't know, maybe have uh, maybe have separate endpoints for those, even if they're just stubs that point to the same method behind the scenes, just so that's that's easier to to, un, un, to disentangle if you want to change it. Um, but definitely for like four web front ends, you know, you. You, the CSRF framework is definitely what you want to rely on if you can. And if you can't, I'd love to know more about your situation because that sounds interesting. <laughs> channels, so I can't, I, I don't want to say anything authoritative um, because I haven't looked into them. Okay. Has, Has anyone here used channels? And know about security implications of channels? Have to. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, so. What are you using to broker that is? There's no um, problem. Yeah, yeah. Then you need to make sure that you've secured your reticence. Django channel security, 20 minute talk, I don't want to give it. Did you give it after you figured it out? <laughs> he just solved it for me. All right, then you, 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 you want to give it a talk? <laughs> I haven't actually used it. 
Well, somebody, somebody go to use Django channels, figure out the security issue, give it a thumbs up. All right, so thank you. Feel free to come up to me after with the questions. Everybody knows. So I think we have a few minutes at least. We've got a little bit of time. Um, and there's pizza. There's still some pizza. Uh, or there's new, newer pizza. Uh, so uh, feel free to hang out and chat and socialize and meet with people and talk with the whole thing starting. Thanks again. Oh, let me stop recording.